Good morning. You want to go ahead and grab your Bibles. You can open up to 2 Samuel chapter 6. We'll be in 2 Samuel 6 this morning. Uh, as you're turning there, I just want to acknowledge up front uh, my indebtedness to R.C. Sproul and C.J. Mahaney for some of what I'm going to be saying today and some writing and sermons uh, from those guys. So uh, here we are, week two of our series, People God Killed. And the subtitle is really important since the title itself is a little bit bracing. The subtitle is a study in holiness and grace. And last week we looked closely at holiness. In fact, my argument last week is that we can't actually understand grace until we understand holiness. And so we looked at the holiness of God specifically. This week we're going to try and get ourselves much closer to the grace piece as we go through this. We're going to dig deeper into it. Now, last week, and this was a disappointment to some of you I know, God did not actually kill anyone in our passage, although Isaiah was pretty scared, I'll admit. He will today. We're going to see his holiness man in the passage today. You guys are awfully nervous. His holiness is going to manifest in wrath. And when that happens, we get really uncomfortable. We start to ask all sorts of questions. Some of the questions I mentioned last week, you know, Jesus will say things like, turn the other cheek. And then you got God, you know, wiping out Canaan. And we go, did you not feel like turning the cheek? today. Or James says everyone should be slow to become angry. And we want to ask God for a definition of slowness because he seems to be flying off the handle in a passage like where we'll be today. Never mind the big question, of course. All of that's just dancing around the issues still of things like hell and judgment. God is condemning people to an eternal suffering because what? They gossiped this just doesn't seem fair. Those are some of the questions we raised last week, and those are questions I left hanging over us. I didn't answer any one of those questions last week. I'm not going to answer most of them today either. Why? Because we are proceeding by steps. So again, we had to hit his holiness first to understand that God can't abide sin, can't tolerate sin, can't look on sin because he is transcendently other. He is morally perfect. And he has made holiness the moral condition of his creation. It's a lot of what we did last week. So we start with step one, holiness. But step two is our sin. We have to understand the depth of our sinfulness. Here's my main idea. My contention for this morning is this. Because you are more sinful than you admit, God's grace is more amazing than you acknowledge. I mean, hopefully not, but that's probably true of most of us, myself included. We're not amazed by grace, which then also means that we get really confused by holy justice. And in fact, we're not so sure the justice is always holy. We're going to see that so clearly in today's story. So let's dive in. We're going to take this in three scenes. Scene one, Uzzah's death kind of gives it away. All right, but um, here you go. Uh, 2 Samuel 6, verses 1 to 7. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Baalah in Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it, and Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nakan, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark of God. Let's get some historical, arc, uh, historical context since we're picking up in the middle of the story here. Um, the ark shows up in 1 Samuel uh, quite a bit. And at that point, and this is a, a period of, of moral decline for Israel, it's being treated as a good luck charm. And um, like dummies, they bring the ark into battle with them, thinking if the ark is there, they're guaranteed to win. They lose, and the ark is captured. Now Philistia has it. 
and so they put it in the temple of their god, Dagon. Uh, Not a good choice. Dagon keeps bowing to the Lord Almighty until eventually his head and arms break off the statue of him. So the Philistines get a little bit concerned about this. They decide to let me just, you know, ship the ark back. They've all got tumors and things at this point. So they they put it on a cart and and give some, you know, cows to lead the thing, and it, it, it takes it to... Well, Abinadab's house. You know, that's where it, it got there. And it's been there for a long time at this point. Because again, that's back in Samuel's day. Now we got that whole Saul thing. And then we got the whole Saul and David thing. And now David. So what's happened? David has defeated the Philistines and united the kingdom of Israel under his reign. And so now it is time to bring the ark to David's new capital, Jerusalem. Politically astute move, of course, because it means people's allegiances won't be divided, but, but there you go. This is a good thing. This is a time of national celebration. In fact, he's got 30,000 men, including his mighty men, who are like famous guys, with him as he does this. Why? Because the ark is not a good luck charm. It is the symbol of God's presence with his people. It is God's throne on earth what it says in verse 2. He sits in this little mercy seat that the angels are making when they hold out their wings like this, these these gold angels that they made. So this is the place where atonement is made. On Yom Kippur, the, the day of atonement, this is where the high priest goes just that one day out of year to sprinkle blood there to make atonement for his people. In Romans 3, when it says that God offered Christ as a sacrifice of atonement, the word that's used is the mercy seat. God is that, Jesus is that place where atonement is made. So that's how significant the ark is. So this is not just bringing a cool artifact to Jerusalem. This is bringing God back to the center of his people. And the Israelites are absolutely caught up in the wonder and excitement of that moment. Like they are having a party here. But emotion is not enough. It is not enough to be really excited because they are bringing God back on their terms, as we'll see, and that's dangerous. So this ark, this symbol of God's presence, his throne, they've just plopped on the back of an ox cart. And what happens? The oxen stumble at a certain point and the ark starts to tip. So Uzzah reaches out his hand to steady it. He is not trying to sin. He is not trying to defy God in this moment. This is a simple reflex because that's how we work. A dish falls, you reach your hand out. Somebody told me a story uh, just on Friday, in fact, as they were reading through and reflecting on this passage that uh, they were uh, at a work site and there was a, a lady there who was wondering, they were, they were picking up a storm drain and so one of the big guys was picking up the storm drain the lady was just there watching the process and whatnot and the storm drain slipped. What did the lady do? She stuck her hands in to try and catch it. Just about lost her hands. Didn't, thankfully, okay? It's a reflex, right? So we don't need to over-spiritualize what just happened here. You can say to me until you're blue in the face, I will not move unless the Spirit leads me. And if I throw a baseball at your head, you're going to duck. That's all that's happening here, okay? His motives are pure. He's keeping a sacred object from falling into the muck and mire. What do we expect to happen next? We expect the heavens to part and that cool little sunbeam thing to come down and the heavens to shout, thanks, Uzzah. Really appreciate it, man. But God doesn't thank him. God kills him immediately. Says the Lord's anger burned against him and he struck him down. People don't like this. They try to explain it away. You'll read people who say things like, Uzzah had such respect for the presence of the Lord. He's so overcome with awe that as he touched it, he had a heart attack. I appreciate what they're trying to do, but they're sugarcoating scripture. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God killed him. With no apologies. No euphemisms, nothing like that. There's no trial, there's no appeal, there's no sympathy for the fact that this was just instinct taking over. So that even if he erred, we're probably sitting here wondering, how about a warning? Wouldn't that have been okay here? Like, look, buddy, I know you were trying to do right, but next time, we don't even get that. 
The same Bible that tells us this story says that the Lord is slow to anger and rich in mercy. We need to reconcile these ideas in our mind if we're going to understand Scripture. This is not a contradiction. It just means God is bigger than we thought he is. We need to reconcile what? His holiness and his grace. So if we're honest, we might feel that God is a little harsh here. The punishment is well beyond the crime. This is like being executed for speeding. A lot of us would be in trouble. And so you start to question God's love. And you read a story like this, and again, we haven't even gotten to hell at this point. He seems capricious, vindictive, even unloving. That's how David feels. And at this point, we're probably in the same spot. Let's keep going. See if we can't work out this tension a bit. Let me keep reading verses 8 to 11 as we look at scene 2, David's anger. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. David is asking the same questions we are. He's angry with God, understandably. Have you ever been angry with God? When he doesn't act how we expect him to act, and so we get frustrated, we just kind of let him have it. There's part of me that says, this is okay. If you've read Psalms, you've seen some angry prayers offered to God. God can take it. God is okay with us being open and honest with him. But we need to be careful at the same time. Like, there's a difference between anger as an emotion over which we have no control. I said before, emotions are just the warning lights on your dashboard going, something's happening, I should pay attention so, you know, somebody cuts you off in traffic and your vision narrows and you start to sweat and your hands shake. That's, that's just emotion. But then there's also anger as a, as a mindset, and maybe even as a behavioral choice, as an attitude. And the Bible's quite clear. That one's really dangerous. That's sin, unless it's righteous, which it so rarely is in our case. So if your emotions flare, okay, bring them to God in prayer to work through them, absolutely. But I wouldn't live there because if you're angry with God, let's be so clear about this, it means that you are judging God. You are sitting in judgment upon God. You are saying, God, I am angry because you did not do what you should have done. When you say that out loud, it sounds stupid, doesn't it? But that's how we feel sometimes. That is, when, when we read stories, especially of sinners in the hands of an angry God, the roles quickly reverse, and so that and then we get God in the hands of angry sinners. As we put him through the ringer for a bit. As C.S. Lewis said, we put God in the dock. God is now on trial. He's got to prove himself just and worthy of worship. He's going to have to answer my questions. But again, let's talk about how foolish this is if we were to unpack it just a little bit. We get angry, at least we ought to, when we see injustice or evil. When somebody does something wrong, it is not possible for God to be evil or unjust or to do anything wrong, which means we can never be righteously angry with God. He doesn't ever sin. That's great news, by the way. Jackie Hill Perry works out what exactly this means for us in a neat little syllogism. She says this, if God is holy, then he can't sin. And if he can't sin, then he can't sin against me. And if he can't sin against me, shouldn't that make him the most trustworthy being there is? Yes and amen. It just doesn't always feel that way. It doesn't feel that way to David right now. This was all a little too much, a little too quickly, a little too harsh. Because David has failed to understand God's holiness. And that's the issue. Our problem here is that we don't get the nature of the offense. We underestimate God's holiness and we underestimate our sin. If you don't understand your sin, you can't understand your grace. That's the main point, right? Don't understand your sin, you'll never see his grace as amazing as it is. What Uzzah does here is not an innocent mistake. 
It is not a matter of reflexes. It is an intentional flouting of God's clear standards. Uzzah knew not to touch the ark. Here's Numbers 4, verses 15, 17, and 20, clear as it can be. After Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy furnishings and all the holy articles, when the camp is ready to move, this is talking about the tabernacles, this is talking about everything that goes in the holy of holies, only then are the Kohathites, the Levites, a certain branch of them, to come and do the carrying. But they must not touch the holy things, or what? Was this unclear? No, it's really clear. Or they will die. The Kohathites are to carry those things that are in the tent of meeting. See that the Kohathite tribal clans are not destroyed from among the Levites, so that they may live and not die when they come near the most holy things. Do this for them. Aaron and his sons are to go into the sanctuary and assign to each man his work and what he's to carry. The Kohathites must not go in to look at the holy things, even for a moment, or they will die. Now Uzzah is a Kohathite. He's a Levite. He's in charge of moving the holy things. He knew the regulations, and he knew the punishment for breaking those regulations. You're not even supposed to look at the ark. This thing should have been covered. You read elsewhere in Numbers 4 and and, in Exodus as well. It should be carried on poles. There are little gold rings that go on the ark because nobody ever gets to touch it. You just slide the pole through the rings. You pick up the pole. It had absolutely no business being on an ox cart, and no one should have touched it ever. You see, Uzzah's problem, David's problem, the nation's problem, is that they had grown familiar with the things of God, comfortable with God's presence. They'd grown careless with God and the things of God because they had grown careless with their own sin. Uzzah should not have minded the ark falling to the ground because God does not have a problem with the ground. He created the ground. He's a big fan. He looked at it and he saw that it was good. In contrast to Uzzah, the ground is not in open rebellion against God, committing treason against its creator. The ground is just doing what he made the ground to do, even if that means it gets muddy when the rain falls. There is no way the throne of God should have been touched by a sinful human hand. Uzzah's mistake was in thinking that his hand was any cleaner than the dirt. Not even close. He should have let it fall. He should have left it there. He should have gone home, read his Bible, come back, and done things the right way. Then these 30,000 people could have approached Jerusalem with celebration and not in an angry, fearful funeral procession. But David's question is key here. How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? David's starting to understand the tension of Scripture. Well, then we can't be in his presence because this is sinful. And so his anger very quickly turns to fear, you think. (laughs) Yeah, that makes sense. Because he's looking at Uzzah lying on the ground there going, if it happened to Uzzah, it could happen to me. It could happen to all of us. should happen to all of us. In the Holiness of God, R.C. Sproul uh, quotes uh, Roman Catholic theologian Hans Kung, who points out that the most mysterious aspect of the mystery of sin is not that the sinner deserves to die, but rather that the sinner in the average situation continues to exist. That's the shocking thing. Our question when we read this story should not be, why is God punishing this sin, but why does he allow us to keep rebelling against him? That's the shocking part. And again, we are committing treason against the high king, the king of kings. What human king has ever allowed treason to go unpunished this long? See, God is so slow to anger that when his anger does flare up, we're shocked. Now that patience is meant to lead us to repentance, but it doesn't always work that way, does it? Sometimes his patience leads us to a lax view of our sin. R.C. Sproul, again, he shares an illustration when he was a seminary professor. He taught kind of an introductory uh, college class, and he was very clear on day one of the class, like this was numbers style, here's the law. Three papers, they're due on these dates. Does not matter what happens. Those are the dates the papers are due. 
If you're sick in a hospital bed, send it FedEx, okay? They come in these days. Well, that first paper comes around. You know how the story goes, right? About 10% of the students go, oh, Dr. Sproul, I am so sorry. And the excuses come flying. You know, the dog ate the homework and then died, so we had the dog's funeral with the homework inside it. It was awful. And, and he says, okay, okay, I'll give you grace. I'll give you grace. You have until tomorrow. Second paper comes around. What happens? Those 10% figure their stuff out, get their act together. No, 20% of the class didn't have their paper done. Same story, same excuses. All right, all right, you can have one more day. Third paper comes around. You really know where this story goes. Now half the class doesn't have their paper. And he says, all right, if you didn't turn your paper in, you get an F on this assignment. How'd they respond? How would you respond? That's not fair. (laughs) That's a dumb thing to say to a smart professor. (laughs) He said, all right, you want justice. You want me to be fair? You were late on the last paper also. That one's an F too. I'm sorry. (laughs) What I meant was, thanks for your grace last time around, but that's how we work. If we don't get the punishment, we grow lax in our view of sin. And I keep saying we, because we need to make this personal at this point. Right? The question is not, why does God allow them to keep sinning? Why does God allow me to keep rebelling against him? And we need to reckon with our own sin. What happened to Uzzah is what I deserve. Now, most of us are very comfortable with God punishing sin, really. And some of you are like, nope, that's not what my friends and neighbors say. They are. They long for justice. We have all cried out at different times, how long, Lord? We want God to deal with injustice. In fact, we often think he's too slow to deal with the evil in the world. So you read about the horrors of sex trafficking in Southeast Asia. where These poor families are tricked into selling their daughters. They think they're going off to get a good job. They'll pay the loan back in the big city, all that kind of stuff. And before they know what's happening, they're locked in a small room where they will see 50 to 20 clients daily. And we ask, where is God? Why doesn't God strike them dead? You see, we've got no problem with God's punishment, do we? We just think it should be directed elsewhere. We want God to, if I could put it this way, get the hell out of earth. All the hellishness that we brought into this world, we want him to cleanse the world of it. We just, we don't want him to do it in us. We want him to eradicate sex trafficking, yet then we read Matthew 5, and Jesus says, you've heard it said you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you, if you even look at a woman with lust in your eyes, you've committed adultery with her. That's a problem. Jesus wants to get rid of sex trafficking and sexual exploitation. He just takes it a whole lot more seriously than I do. So, as Joshua Ryan Butler points out in his book, uh, Skeletons in God's Closet, excellent book, we want God to prune one dead limb, but God wants to dig out the whole wicked root. And the problem with that is that now I got a target on my back, too. I'm in the same boat. Or what about genocide? You read about the Holocaust or the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia where a quarter of the population is wiped out, or Rwanda where 800,000 are hacked to death in 100 days, or... We could just go to Ukraine today or anywhere else where this is happening. Where's God? How come he didn't strike Hitler dead? How come he didn't strike Pol Pot dead? And then we come back to Matthew 5. And Jesus says, you've heard it said you shall not murder. But I tell you, if that anger flares up and you just start throwing out reckless words, you are guilty of murder. Butler again, he says, you know, we want to put boundaries on the wildfire and God wants to snuff out the wicked spark and that spark is in me. And that spark is in you. The problem is not out there. The problem is in here. As Alexander Solzhenitsyn said before he was shipped off to Siberia, the line separating good from evil does not pass between the borders of countries, but it passes straight through the human heart. If you are feeling angry with God when he judges, or when he is not judging the people you think he should judge, look at your own heart. 
and ask the question, why am I still here? Why am I alive? And that will make you think of grace and the blessing of God, which is our third scene. Let me read the rest of the chapter, although we're not really going to talk through every verse here. Now, King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has is the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with the shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. When she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. And he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women, and all the people went back to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would do. And David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Again, I'm going to treat this briefly. We're not going to go verse by verse through this, but there are some things we've got to draw out from here. So what happens next in the story is that David leaves the ark with Obed-Edom. And if you're reading your Bibles imaginatively, as I certainly hope you do, this is interesting. How do he convince him? Like there's a, just a knock at the guy's door. There's 30,000 people on his front lawn. Hi, I'm David. You may have heard of me. These are a few of my friends. He's going to need the mighty men at this point, certainly. He's going to point them out, almost certainly. You see that guy over there? Um, yeah, he killed a lion by ripping it in two. He actually chased the lion. He's going to ask a favor of you. You want to be careful how you answer him. Because you see, we got this cool relic. I would love for you to store it in your garage. You might want to put some stuff around it, though. Um, I'd highly recommend you not touch it. You see that guy lying on the ground over there? He's not asleep. You're thinking the only way Obed-Edom was convinced is that he probably had a neighbor he didn't like. You should check this thing out. It's pretty cool. Go ahead and put your hand on it. But what's most interesting for us, because the Bible does not tell us how he convinced Obed-Edom, what's most interesting for us is that Obed-Edom is richly blessed. Why? He's not part of the revival. We're not told he was part of the procession here, whereas Uzzah is part of this restoration. He's got a zeal for God's glory, and he's now dead. But here's this other person who's just got it in his garage, and he's being richly blessed. It's this reminder of God's grace. Never forget that God's desire is to bless us. That's his heart towards us. This is also what God uses to bring David back. Because David hears about the blessing and goes, we need that ark. We need God's presence in Jerusalem. And he comes back only this time he does it right. He went back. He read his Bible. Do you see verse 13? They're carrying the ark. It doesn't specify the poles, but we know that it's on poles. How do we know that? Because they're still walking. That's how we know that. So he does it right. And it is accompanied by the sacrifice of praise. There is this interesting side note, of course, that Michal despises him because of his dancing before the Lord, basically in his underwear. That is what God uses to end Saul's dynasty, finally. Because certainly David and Michal could have had a child together that could have been the next king of Israel. And so in God's providence, in God's ways, this is what God uses. But I think it's important we just pause for a moment and look at David and how he worships. And when he gets called out on it, he says, I will become even more undignified than this. Here's another one of those tensions. I said our worship can't just be emotional, right? Because that led them to treat God in, in their own terms. 
but neither should our worship be dignified. And you see, most of the church falls into one or the other, right? We got to figure out to have some sort of scripture-based, undignified worship. But what that means, of course, is we should probably look at ourselves as we're worshiping before the Lord. Like when we come to the Lord's table in a few minutes here, like what is happening in us? Do people see it? If no one ever looks at you like you're weird when you're worshiping the Lord, spend some time in 2 Samuel 6. That's all I'll say. This is why when glorious day rolls around, that's the way it should be. But what's happened? Why is David dancing before the Lord anyway? Because he finally gets sin. He gets God's holiness, so he gets God's grace. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, who could stand? We would all look like us, but with you there is forgiveness. Therefore, you are feared, so that we may with reverence serve you, worship you like this. That change of heart that David has, we all need to experience. Remember, when we are offended by God's wrath, it is because we don't understand his holiness. Right? You don't get holiness, you're not going to get wrath. You're not going to get judgment. You're not going to get our, uh, the, the, the effect of our sin on God, which means you won't get God's grace. How deep the Father's love for us is. Look, if you want to be offended by God's judgment, if you want to be outraged with God, there's only one place you should feel that. And that's at the foot of the cross. We sometimes talk about and write best-selling books with ridiculous titles like when bad things happen to good people. There's only one time ever that a bad thing happened to a good person because there's only ever been one good person. And yes, God punished him. Not for his sin, but for ours. God has never judged an innocent man, woman, or child except once. And that was only because Jesus volunteered to be the holy, spotless, sinless lamb offered in our place. And you can imagine the pain that God felt when he poured out the fullness of his righteous wrath on the only innocent person he ever judged. Do you want to be outraged with God? Ask him about his son. He never did anything wrong. Why did you judge him? You can read the answer on every page of this book. Because I love you. Because he knows we need an answer to the question that David asked, how then can the ark of God ever come to me? How can I live in God's presence? Only if he makes it right. You see, I can explain Uzzah. It was not hard to explain to you that Uzzah deserved to die, but I cannot explain why God loves me. God should have struck me dead years ago. And God should have struck you dead years ago as well. Are you not stunned by the patience of Almighty God? The question is not why was Uzzah killed. The question is why are we still alive? Why is God so merciful? Why have we not all been judged already? Not only are we not judged, I mean, you look at it like the ark of the Lord, the presence of the Lord. God doesn't just say, okay, now, now that you're covered by the blood of Christ, you can timidly approach him. You're permitted to do that. No, he commands us to come before him boldly to plead for grace and mercy in our time of need. Why? Because all of that fierce anger fell on Jesus instead of us. What do you do with love like that? You must see yourself as sinful, like Uzzah, like the traffickers and the genocides, because you are not that different This is the caterpillar and the archangel from last week, right? You must see yourself as sinful or else you will not see God as gracious because you are more sinful than you admit. God's grace is more amazing than you acknowledge. So, takeaway is very simple. Acknowledge it. Let that lead you into undignified worship. Let that lead you to treat God as he deserves 
the fearful love and treat yourself as you deserve, which is with a whole lot more humility, and treat your sin as it deserves. Like, stop coddling your sin. It's no big deal. Yes, it is. You put a gun to its head. What does Jesus say? If your hand causes you to sin, give it a little slap. No, cut it off. Your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Don't try to touch the ark with that sinful hand. Like, let God kill the hell in you because that's a whole lot better than the alternative, isn't it? As we go through this series, the question we have to keep asking is, why? but not why did God kill all those people? Why did you accept the punishment that justice demands should have been mine? And you accepted it in Christ and said, why would you do that for people who every day rebel against you and hate and dishonor and oppose you? See, that is a lesson in holiness. That is a lesson in grace. Let's pray. Lord, we are humbled before you because we know that we are no different than Uzzah, that we deserve absolutely, without question, without even pretending to mount an excuse to suffer Uzzah's fate. That's what we deserve. We deserve judgment. We should not be alive even now because of our sin. But Lord, we are because of your mercy and grace and love. And may that truth humble us and lead us to worship you with an undignified abandon, not just when we sing, but in the way we live our lives, in the way we put sin to death, in the boldness with which we share the gospel, and in the boldness with which we come before your throne of grace to receive mercy. Lord, we worship you and we thank you for the grace that we know. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.